Welcome to the Educate, Empower, and Evolve podcast. My name is Haley Vera, and I'm a lifestyle coach with my roots in holistic nutrition, personal training, and yoga. I'm a total nerd with a huge passion for gut health and optimizing performance naturally. My mission with the E3 podcast is to help you acquire the knowledge that you need to evolve and reach the next level of yourself. friends, welcome back to the E3 podcast. I'm your host, Haley Vera, and as always, I'm excited to be here. Today's conversation is going to be around animal protein versus plant-based protein. And I'm not going to focus very heavily on plant-based proteins today. I do want to focus mainly around protein, protein digestibility. I also want to talk about hydrochloric acid, so your actual ability to break down and utilize protein. And I want to talk about being overfed and undernourished and how following a standard American diet can leave us in a place where we're over-consuming calories and under-consuming micronutrients, and how a high-protein um, diet or a diet high in animal proteins can actually help to course correct or improve that, improve the ratios of calories to micronutrients. A lot of um, arguments out there are around um, animal protein being carcinogenic, but if you start looking deeper into that, animal protein is not car carcinogenic in and of itself. You are made of animal protein. That's the answer, okay? So it doesn't make sense for animal protein to be negative for your body when that's literally what you're made of. Now, a lot of people are looking at animal protein in terms of just protein in general, but they're not looking at the quality. So they might be looking at burgers or pepperoni or lunch meats or um, meats that are smoked or have nitrates additives um, added to them that can actually be carcinogenic compounds. And so, yes, if you take someone on a vegetarian diet and you compare it to someone who has a standard American diet, has the acronym SAD, <laughs> standard American diet, um, then Yes, there are going to be arguments around which is healthier. And in my eyes, there's going to be arguments around which is less healthy, right? It's like, which one's going to be less healthy for you? The one that's packed full of, um, you know, animal protein that's full of nitrates and, you know, all kinds of chemical compounds and has gone through a ton of processing or the vegetarian diet. It's like, there are, there are going to be um, like positions that we can argue from on both sides there. But if we start looking at protein and good quality protein, grass-fed meat, wild-caught fish, not farmed fish, grass-fed beef, not grain-fed beef. If we're looking at organic park, pork, if we're looking at organic free-range chickens, that kind of animal protein is higher in anti-inflammatory compounds, things like our omega-3s, uh, rather than the higher omega-6 compound that we're going to see in something like a grain-fed beef, just simply from what those animals are eating or consuming themselves. And so paying attention to the quality of your protein is so important. And a lot of people disregard that and they just buy whatever protein is the cheapest and in bulk. And I definitely encourage you to start looking at options in your local area, like local butchers, um, local farms, where you're able to find locally raised, um, humanely raised animals. I know a lot of people go vegetarian because of the belief systems or I guess more from like the humane um, perspective. And if that's you, I completely support you. And I'm not here to tell you that that is wrong, but I am here to tell you that if you are not adequately supplementing your diet, that you are on a landslide to some health problems in the future. And I've been there. I really struggled to digest animal protein because my gut health was so compromised. So for those of you who don't know my backstory, I was on antibiotics for about five years from the age of 14 to 19 for acne. Now I should have been cycled on and off the acne medication, but because the acne was so detrimental to my self-confidence, I would just skip from one acne medication to the next. And I was on acne medication for about five years, which did a lot of damage to my gut and created a lot of hyperpermeability. On top of that, I was bulimic. And so obviously my stomach lining um, and stomach acid production would have been very compromised. And so my protein 
uh, breakdown was also compromised because the first place that protein starts to get broken down is actually in your stomach. And so the the process of that requires adequate levels of hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid is a compound that's going to take the long chains of amino, amino acids, and we call these peptides, and it's going to break them down into the single amino acids for our body to absorb those and to utilize them, okay? So if you struggle with digesting proteins, and that's the reason you've gone vegetarian, I'm here to tell you that the protein is not the problem. Your digestion is the issue. And if you are eating in a rush or distracted state on your computer, on your phone, in your car, if you are eating when you are highly stressed or anxious, maybe you aren't getting adequate sleep or you work in a high stress environment and those are the settings that you're eating protein in, that protein won't feel good because it will be hard to digest. And if it's not broken down in your stomach, it makes its way into the small and large intestine where it can be fermented. It can cause a lot of bloating, distension, gas, and discomfort. And so if that's you and you're like, protein always gives me protein farts and it always gives me bloating and I never feel good when I eat red meat. Well, here's the thing. The protein isn't the problem. Please don't blame the protein. You need to start looking at why. And the reason is often that you have inadequate hydrochloric acid production, which requires a few micronutrients, but it also requires for you to be in a relaxed state when you're eating your meals. Really key. That's the reason I went vegetarian is because meat made me feel like shit. But guess what? eating only plants made me feel worse. And it took a couple of years for that to really catch up to me, but my hair was falling out. I was exhausted all the time. I was severely anemic. And I went and I was working with um, someone who did blood work analysis at the time, touch for health practitioner. I went and saw her and she's like, she didn't even ask me if I was a vegetarian. She just said, you need to start eating meat. And I was like, oh my God, what? I've been a vegetarian for two years. She's like, no, you, you need to start eating meat. You're really unhealthy. Uh, and you're deprived of micronutrients. And I did. And I started reintroducing fish first. So I started doing like salmon. I started reintroducing a little bit more eggs into my diet. And then I slowly in increased it into poultry and then leaned a little bit more into the red meat. And it wasn't easy for me to do mentally because part of the reason that I went vegetarian, I'd convinced myself that it was because it was more ethical. But at the end of the day, I did it because eating meat made me feel like shit. And I was looking for reasons to justify that to myself. It doesn't make me feel good and it's unethical. So I had to kind of undo those belief systems and unravel those and start to reform, um, you know, a, a new way of eating for myself again, and to be able to balance that out. But first of all, you guys is don't blame the protein. The protein is not the problem. The problem starting with your digestion, the quality of your protein matters. So if you're struggling, let's say you have whey protein, this whey protein makes my stomach feel like shit. Okay, look at the ingredient label, what's in there. If it's more than three ingredients, get a new protein powder because it's gonna be full of things like sucralose, aspartame, fillers, artificial flavors, artificial colors, and all kinds of crap. Um, different fibers and fillers to make it more inexpensive th for them, more palatable for you. At the end of the day, a whey protein should consist of a whey protein isolate, ideally a hydrolyzed whey protein isolate, so it's microfiltered. And that protein also should only contain whey isolate, perhaps stevia and maybe something like vanilla or cocoa powder where it's natural. And actually, I found one on Amazon recently that's really good, and it's Protein Co. Um, protein co dot so protein co and they actually have a protein powder that has three ingredients i was blown away so there's they're hard to find but they are um they are out there and you want to find a protein powder that has the least ingredients especially if you get digestive distress because it's not the protein problem and whey protein is one of the best absorbed proteins in your body and it's superior especially post-workout because if post-workout, your stress hormones are going to be elevated, you're not going to have the hydrochloric acid production to break down a steak right after you train. I always recommend waiting about 30 minutes after you eat, which is why I tell my clients go walk for 20, 20, 30 minutes on the treadmill or 15 to 20 minutes. Then by the time you drive home, it's going to be time to have that first meal. So let's talk about protein digestibility now that we're on this. The, I have a little table in front of me from the Journal of Sports and Science Medicine, and it's showing beef, casein, eggs, milk, soy, and whey proteins as the highest in nutritional value by PDCAA. So what that means is protein digestibility protein digestibility corrected amino acid scores at the top yeah uh the top 
with 1.00 as the amino acid score is casein, egg, milk, soy, and whey. Now, soy is on here, but if you actually start looking at what that uh, the PC PDCAAs um, are taking into consideration, it is the highest nutritional value by the amino acid score. So what are the amino acids in those foods? But if we start talking about anti-nutrients and gut health, the PD, uh, PDCAAs do not take into con- account other factors um, in terms of your lifestyle factors that might affect amino acid uptake and muscle protein synthesis. They also do not take into consider factors like trypsin inhibitors, lectins, tannins, and other things that will reduce protein hydrolysis and amino acid absorption from things like plant-based proteins like soy, okay? So soy might be high up there on the actual amino acid profile that's in soy, but if we look at the the, uh, anti-nutrients that are in soy, there will be things that reduce protein hydrolysis, and that means that it's not going to be as superior as something like the whey protein that has the same 1.00 score. The next highest on here is beef at 0.92, and then black beans, 0.75, peanuts, 0.52, and wheat gluten, 0.25. This is just kind of a total tangent going down another tangent here. Um, One day I was in the store at Safeway and I was getting some burger buns to have burgers with my family and salmon arm. And I was at Askew's and I was like, sweet. I grabbed some buns because I said gluten-free. And I, before I got to the checkout, I was like, let's look at the ingredients of these just to like be sure that they're decent quality before I feed them to my family. The first ingredient was gluten. I was like, oh, sorry, it, it wasn't a gluten-free bun. That was the wrong term. It was a uh, low-carb bun is what it was advertised as, a low-carb bun. And I was like, cool. These look, they were like a nice brown color. They looked very like, um, <laughs> they looked very satisfying. They look like good buns. So I grabbed them and I looked at the ingredients. The first ingredient was gluten. And I was blown away. I was like, who makes a product of straight gluten? Gluten is a protein, but it has a very, very low protein digestibility score. And uh, wheat gluten, you guys, is a very large uh, molecule of protein and it's very difficult to digest, which is why a lot of people struggle to break down gluten in their stomach and then it makes its way into the small and large intestine undigested and then that causes inflammation and then that can make its way past the irritated gut lining that becomes a leaky gut. And then we end up with protein in the bloodstream, which can cause headaches and inflammation and joint problems and all the all the other fun things. So we know that in terms of our protein digestibility, that our animal proteins and our whey protein and egg white protein is all going to be at the very top of the protein digestibility. And our animal proteins are not coming along with the anti-nutrients. So in plants, we actually have anti-nutrient factors. Um, these things are called trypsin inhibitors, lectins, and tannins. And these are also reducing protein hydrolysis. <clears throat> so um, the anti-nutrients can actually interfere with protein hydrolysis and hinder the absorption of amino acids, which affects the overall nutritional value of these plant-based proteins. Now we can use appropriate cooking and processing techniques to reduce the levels of anti-nutrients and improve protein digestion and absorption. Um, for example, like <clears throat> fermented soy products are going to be better than a plain soy product, like using a tempeh over um, a tofu is going to be better. Uh, and also soaking your nuts and seeds. So taking like, let's say, for example, cashews or, or almonds and soaking them overnight and then rinsing or draining the water off. That is also going to help with lowering the the lectins in those nuts and seeds and, and cooking. Cooking plants can also help with lowering the tannins. So not I, f- I feel like the the raw vegan diet is probably one of the scariest ones in in my in my brain um because not only are we not reducing any of those anti nutrients um but we're not uh we don't have good amino acid availability and as i mentioned at the beginning of this podcast protein is so much more has so much more importance and weight in our health than just for building muscle um it weighs very heavily in our mental health physical health and hormone health Etc. Um, I also want to talk about creatine here briefly because animal protein sources are really rich in creatine, which a lot of you know gym bros are supplementing with. I actually supplement with creatine. It's one of my favorite supplements for um, muscle growth, but also for brain health. It plays a really crucial role in energy metabolism. It's also the precursor to um, 
sorry, it helps to stimulate satellite cell growth and satellite cells are the precursor to muscle cells. And it also helps with brain energy, not just energy metabolism, but also our brain energy. And adequate creatine intake has been associated with improved cognitive function, memory, and attention. Now, tiny amounts of creatine can be found in some plants, um, but animal protein remains the most reliable and abundant source of creatine. And vegetarians and vegans are often very depleted in creatine. And by supplementing with creatine, you can have a lot more energy and a lot more brain function. So um, I want to talk about overfed and undernourished here in a second, but I first want to go into kind of our gut health. Um, so gut health and some specific amino acids that are going to be very difficult to find in your plant-based foods. Animal protein provides essential amino acids such as glutamine and glycine, which are really beneficial for our gut health. Glutamine supports the integrity of the intestinal lining and helps in the repair and maintenance of gut tissue. Um, and the abundance of these amino acids and animal protein contributes to our optimal gut function. Where we see the most glutamine and uh, glycine is actually in collagen. Um, so glycine contributes to collagen production and the glutamine supports the integrity of the intestinal lining, but we'll find gl glutamine and glycine in collagen protein. So collagen protein is another great one to supplement. You can also make bone broth and have an abundance of glutamine and glycine um, available in that. If you do struggle with breaking down protein, you got, you know, you don't have good protein digestion right now, and you're working on healing your gut. One of the best things you can do is slow cooked meats and bone broth. That's really going to help with the amino acid availability way better, way superior to like grilled meats. And again, we just have to come back around to understanding that lunch meats, prepackaged meats, meats that are packed full of extra flavors, um, like your pepperonis and your smoked meats and your cured meats. Um, those are all going to be of lesser quality and have more compounds that we, that could potentially be carcinogenic or could potentially be uh, causing disruption to the delicate balance of your gut flora. So we want to make sure that our protein sources are coming from good places. And like I said, try and find something locally sourced uh, and humanely raised. I know that around my area, there's a lot of farms and it's, it's really quite easy to find good quality meat. Now, the micronutrient availability is, is where we're going to go into this next, which is the overfed and undernourished. The majority of people right now are actually not looking to increase their calorie consumption. They want to achieve overall satiety. And so increasing animal protein is one of the best ways to increase your satiety. So feeling fuller longer also helps to burn more calories at rest, and it provides bioavailable micronutrients. This is a really big problem with plant um, plant-based foods is that a lot of the micronutrients, for example, iron is in a form that's very difficult for a body to absorb. So an iron in, let's say, for example, spinach would be an F2 iron and it's a non-heme iron. And our body actually has to, to take that iron and convert it into F3, which is heme iron in the body. And it does that in the actual epithelial cells in the gut lining. And if your body has damage to the intestinal epithelial cells or to the gut lining, or there's gut-derived inflammation or negative gram bacteria overgrowth or something else going on inside internally, you'll struggle to, um, to convert the um, plant-based iron into an iron that you can actually use. And so then we can end up very iron deficient, which is why a lot of vegetarians struggle with iron absorption. So just in 100 grams, a very small serving, about three and a half ounces, the, in a ribeye steak, there is, uh, 14.7% of your iron, uh, for daily value. There is 16% of your copper, there is 17% of your B2, 22% of your B3. There is 23% of your B6. Um, there is also 134% of your B12. There is 14% um, of choline. There are 10 milligrams of omega-3 and 240 milligrams of omega-6. Now, if we take this and we find this to be a grass-fed steak, you will you will see those ratios Um improved, meaning that we're going to have higher omega-3, lower omega-6. And we also see selenium at 46% and zinc at 70% of your daily value. And there's so many men who are deficient in zinc still, right? And so it's about good quality protein. You're not going to get these micronutrients in processed or cured meats the same way that you will in a home-cooked like ribeye steak or a slow-cooked roast or something like that, um, that are going to be very superior. Now, I could dive into organ meats here and we can talk about 
<laughs> they're even higher. Like if we start comparing like a steak to liver, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Um, there's, I, I can't remember the exact percentage of vitamin A in liver, but it's more than your daily value. And just like, in probably, I think one or two ounces, it's, it's crazy how nutrient dense organ meats are, but I'm not going to walk that path today because I think that's a podcast in itself because organ meats are obviously a little bit off putting. So one of the best things, actually, if you are deficient in iron, you're struggling with anemia is spleen. <laughs> Please don't go eat spleen. That would be nasty. Uh, liver is gross enough, but you can actually get spleen capsules. And so if you're struggling with iron absorption, do not take an iron supplement, please. Very sketchy. And iron transfusions are even sketchier. I'm not sure if you have listened to my podcast on iron before, um, but iron is not is is not the issue here. It's actually your ability to uptake it. And so just taking more iron if your body's struggling to uptake it. The reason that happens is that we have this um, hormone called hepcidin. When our body is uh, inflamed and our immune system is active with leaky gut, we end up producing more hepcidin to downregulate the uptake of iron because iron is like rocket fuel for viruses. So it's our body's natural protective mechanism, but it actually works against us if we have chronic low-grade um, dysbiosis or chronic low-grade inflammation in the gut, then we end up with a down regulation of the um, uptake of iron and we end up iron deficient. Then we're trying to put it into the body in things like iron transfusions, but your body still isn't properly uh, like taking it up, right? So now we just have high blood concentrations of iron, which can be actually dangerous. And I am a very, I'm very anti- iron transfusions and iron supplementation. I think that if you are eating enough animal protein, slow cooked meats, and if you are um, supplementing a little bit with liver and potentially with spleen capsules that you're going to be getting enough iron in there. Um, and so for myself, like I really struggled, as I mentioned with poor gut health, antibiotic overuse and what I started doing when I came back was doing a lot of like stews and soups and things like that, where I mixed the meat in and it was a little bit more palatable to me. That's something that will actually benefit you and bone broth as well. Um, bone broth is just something easy. You can flavor it with whatever herbs and spices you like. One of my favorite products is actually best of the bone, not sponsored by them. Wish I was, um, I'll have to reach out to them and let them know, um, maybe send them this podcast, but they're actually a company in Australia and, the best of the bone is like a concentrated bone broth. So the powdered bone broths are not as superior um, or are less uh, qu lesser quality and less micronutrients than the actual concentrated bone broth that you can get in the jars from best of the bone. Um, so the overfed and undernourished conversation, you guys, is, is just primarily that a lot of people are eating very micronutrient deprived foods and over consuming calories and still feeling hungry and still feeling unsatisfied because they're not meeting their body's micronutrient needs. And so if you want to feel like you have more energy and to be able to maintain a healthy body composition more easily, having a high protein diet is key. And the quality of protein is so important. I can't stress that enough. So good quality protein, one gram of protein per pound of body mass is a good position to start in. Um, I, I recommend that you actually base it on your lean body mass, which is what I do for my clients. But if you're just getting started one, uh, gram per pound works. So if you're 150 pounds, 150 grams of protein, pretty simple. I think that's everything for today. I hope this was helpful for you guys. And if you have any questions about this, shoot me a DM on Instagram or on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram, Haley Vera fitness and on Facebook at Haley Vera. I would love to chat. Thank you so much for tuning in. Peace, love, and personal growth, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode on the E3 podcast. I had so much fun sharing my knowledge with you, and I hope that you enjoyed today's show. If you found value in this episode, the number one thing that you can do to support the show is share this episode on your social media platforms or leave a review. If you'd like to find out about the lifestyle programs I offer online, go to healthpillars.ca and click apply today to fill out an application for coaching. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Peace, love, and personal growth.